can I ask that um, everyone gets a piece of paper? This is in part kind of kinesthetic activity to wake you up. So in the next five minutes, you have to end up with a piece of paper in your hand. It's a slow process, and I don't mind you all shuffling. I'm, uh, I do think I'm a little bit difficult to define, but I actually think everyone is a little bit difficult to define. I think we just wear often the most obvious persona professionally because that makes life easy. Whereas in practice, we are often multiple people. And we've heard a lot about that in recent days, about identity. I th didn't live in the United Kingdom until I was 14. I have a British passport. I don't think of myself as particularly British, although I obviously sound quite English. I'm actually technically Welsh. Um, I'm bilingual French-English, um, and now I live in New Zealand. So don't ask me my nationality. I can't really tell you. I can only tell you what my passport is. In terms of what I do for a living, my current job title is I'm a strategic e-learning advisor, but I'm the first person to have that title, so I don't think anyone really knows uh, what I do. And what I am, I think, is both confused and optimistic. Um, and I describe myself, although Sue didn't really like the description at dinner the other day, I said I'm an enthusiastic cynic. Why am I here rather than somebody else? Which is quite an interesting question. Well, I have a talent which um, you probably can't see, which is that I can see the future. Uh, it has a lot to do with alcohol and drugs, but I, I, I can see the future. And so what I'd like you to do with me today is to engage in a, a little process of foresight. It's not prediction. We're not guessing. It's foresight. I just want you to imagine with me what the future might be. And we're going to do that by thinking a little bit about one person and the impact that education will have on that individual. Um, do you only interpret what I say, in which case I need to read out slides? Okay, thank you. I didn't know if you wanted me to just pause. So... I'd like us to be thinking particularly about uh, Trin, who starts school this year, and to be thinking all the time about her as someone who, in 2077, will be approaching what we might now regard as retirement. Although in reality, I doubt there will be any such thing as formal retirement in 2077, just to have her in mind. Now, during this conference, uh, one of the interesting things that's emerged for me is a number of themes which I think have come up again and again and again in, in conferences in the last 10 years or so in different forms, and the language changes, and we talk about different things, but it's interesting how they come up um, almost with the same sense of urgency and enthusiasm. And so I'm going to try and pick my way through some of these ideas whilst at the same time trying to upset you just a little bit. Um, I, I upset someone else the other day by saying that I always think that if half of the audience don't look slightly annoyed when you're talking, then you must be doing something wrong. If you all look really, really happy, then clearly I'm not doing something quite right. In Estonia, is it considered very impolite to drink from the bottle? Or is that culturally acceptable? Okay, thank you. It's always worth asking. So, curriculum change. We've talked a little bit about what will happen to the curriculum. I know there was a, a comment about the fact that in the United Kingdom, we've reduced the curriculum to a limited number of subjects compared to Estonia. It was a, a throwaway comment, I think, as part of a question. But it's interesting. I think there are changes, and we need to be thinking about why those changes are coming about. They don't happen in isolation. So to be thinking about some of the trends that are taking place at a social level, in very, very broad terms, and then thinking back to our own experience as people that work in education, and try and make a personal connection between those things. So I'm not going to be telling you 
what the direct connection is. I want you to be thinking from your own personal experience as we discuss some of these broader ideas. I'm here in Estonia. There are Swedes and Finns and other people from the United Kingdom. We had Nancy from the United States. And it was a clear illustration of um, a kind of cultural multipolarity. The fact that we now see ourselves as being different th people in different places. It's hard, how many times do you ask someone where they're from and you get an answer a bit like me, where I say, well, that's quite a hard question to answer. I find people say that now more and more, and it implies that perhaps there's more of a, a cultural mix and that perhaps we're more fluid in our conceptions of our cultural origins than perhaps our parents were or our grandparents were. There's also clearly uh, a huge spread of media. One of the beautiful things for me now about traveling, because I'm a bit of a news vulture, is that the first thing you do when you arrive in the hotel is you turn on the TV and you look for CNN or Euronews. Or, and that's the most obvious sign that international media has now spread literally all around the globe. You can access media in that way. But also, and I won't repeat all the things that have been said in the conference so far, also all of the proliferation of the, 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 the Twitters and the YouTubes and Wikipedia and all of those things. I mean, the media has just grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And that's going to have uh, an impact. But I'm thinking of it as a social trend. That might sound like a contradiction, that there's media spread and media convergence, but what, what I mean by media convergence is the way in which uh, we're bringing together different types uh, of media. So that in the old days, we had the radio, and perhaps then in 91, 1990, we had the internet. It didn't take long before we had radio on the internet. Now we can get internet on our television sets. So at that very simple level, there is a, a technological convergence. And what this is creating, and there's some, if you just stick that into Google as a term, prosumer, I don't know how that would translate in Estonian, so I'm not even going to try. But that idea that we've gone from the idea that some people are producers and some people are consumers that we now have this concept of someone being a prosumer. They do both. They create content through the wikis uh, that we were talking about earlier, through YouTube publication, through even publishing their own songs. They might be quite amateurish musicians. Uh, if you go and look at YouTube and MySpace, you'll find some very amateurish musicians um, who nonetheless will produce their work and share it. So this idea that people are now prosumers. And these are all very broad social trends. In the context of education, what that appears to be doing, and we're seeing evidence of this certainly in the New Zealand context where the whole primary uh, teacher training curriculum is being rewritten, what we're seeing are, uh, is a thinning in some ways of that curriculum. Less emphasis on the individual subjects in the curriculum because other themes are emerging. I'll come back to that in a second. We're seeing increasingly, I think, an emphasis on uh, the creation of opportunities to learn rather than simply learning taking place. So staff are not being asked simply to engineer a particular learning activity for their students. They're being asked to create uh, a, a wide variety of different opportunities for learning to take place, in some ways less prescriptive. And therefore, and the words come up several times from several presenters so far, this idea that we need more flexibility in that curriculum, maybe more choice. So the, the whole idea of the core curriculum means that one is assuming that all the students have to learn the same thing at each given stage, which is a very kind of mechanistic uh, worldview. Perhaps that's not true. Perhaps there are other, found, there's other kinds of foundational knowledge that would be more socially relevant or culturally relevant to that particular student. So there are questions, I think, about how flexible the curriculum can actually be. The question of adaptability is the degree to which the individual is being encouraged, educated, to be an adaptable learner. So in the most obvious sense, we're talking about teaching people to learn to learn. 
But I think it's a little bit deeper than that. I think what we're seeing in emerging, certainly in U United Kingdom policy and in New Zealand and the other Anglo-Saxon countries, is this idea that the, the individual is to be particularly concerned with the values that are shared in that culture and that there isn't an assumption that the values are clear based on the subject knowledge. So drawing those values out is important. And we're increasingly seeing also, I think, uh, some evidence that the idea of gifted and talented. Do you have an equivalent in Estonia? We have in the UK and in New Zealand, we have whole organizations that deal with gifted and talented. So the very best students are kind of lifted out and go to sort of special classes. And you, you have that kind of system here? Okay. Um, and one of the themes that's emerging, certainly in New Zealand at the moment, is this idea that everyone is differently gifted. So everyone is uniquely gifted. And this was said, I think Nancy said it, I think you said the same thing, so you know, that, that actually everybody has a particular talent. And recognizing that talent and being told that you have that talent and then embodying that talent makes you an, both an effective learner but also an effective human being. To institute a set of measures based on some notion of the core curriculum with standard tests and everybody moving through at the same time immediately disadvantages individuals who don't fit that particular vision, if you like, of a child at 7 or a child at 11 or a child at 14 or whatever. So the idea for them to be able to express and define their own talents and then be measured against those is a trend. Now some of this is unashamedly philosophical and even slightly political with a little p. Um, I make no excuse for that. But actually the, the evidence in terms of the, the changing patterns that we see in national curriculums um, I think gives some weight to the fact that this, these social trends are having an impact. Now, it's slightly frightening, isn't it, really? It's Friday afternoon, and so far, I've enjoyed my sessions. I've enjoyed my interpretation. I sat in without interpretation on something on robotics, and I actually think I learned something, even though I wasn't actually having it translated. That was quite exciting. Um, I, I think I, I, it occurred to me that by this stage, you might be a, just a little bit flat. And you do have laptops, and that's fine. I had a laptop, too, during many of the sessions and took part in an online chat. But I thought we'd do something with a piece of paper. My, my wife is a paper conservator, uh, works of art on paper, and keeps telling me that this is the best technology that was ever invented. Um, it's very durable. We still have uh, information and knowledge exchanged over 3,000 years written on early forms of what we might refer to broadly as paper. So this is a fantastic technology, and we're going to use it today. So this is educational technology in action. Lock the doors. Um, do you all have a piece of paper? Who does not have a piece of paper? Because you're going to feel very left out if you don't have a piece of paper. Everybody has a piece of paper? Everybody have a, has an implement to write with? If you don't have an implement to write with, a pen, uh, turn and ask somebody. Now, we're going, we're going to do this. There's a purpose to this. I'm not just doing it to keep you awake, although it does have that added advantage. Um, I'm going to ask you to write. I'm going to ask you to write on a particular part of the piece of paper. And it doesn't matter what language you write in. Uh, preferably English and Estonian, if we could limit it to those two. But it doesn't actually matter what language you write in. You just have to answer the question as best you can. So please don't be like first-year undergraduate students and ask for 53 different variations on the question as given. Just guess. If, if the instruction isn't clear, make it up. You won't do anybody any harm. There's no test at the end. Okay? So Trin is now 18 years old. And uh, we've moved into the future. It's 2022. And she's preparing to go to university. Uh, it's a university that some of you may have heard of. I don't know. It's, uh, oh, no, you won't have done because you haven't been to 2022. But if you were in 2022, this is actually quite a new institution. And um, she's off to do psychology, neurobiology, and psychometrist studies. And she's done really well at school. Um, and her e-portfolio, which was essentially her entrance for university, um, had four themes. She was very clever because actually her mother, perhaps I should have mentioned the fact that her mother works as a teacher, so that's obviously a help. 
but as a result, she's very aware of the changing nature of the Estonian curriculum. And so the four themes that are emerging in the national curriculum in Estonia are the ones that she based her portfolio on for entrance to university in 2022. And all you have to do is to write down under question one in the box that says question one, is to write down what those four themes were. And you have three minutes to do that, starting now. Okay, what I want you to do now is just take your piece of paper and assuming that you did write something on the piece of paper, I want you to fold it back just so that it's not visible anymore. Just fold it backwards so that what you end up with then is that. Okay? And I want you to hand it to the person on your left or your right and take a piece of paper from the person on your left or your right. If there isn't someone sitting on your left and your right, you are free, thank you, Martin, to just stand up and give it to somebody. But pass the piece of paper to somebody else. It, if, if you already have one, this is quite interesting, undergraduates don't get this either. If, if you already have one, that's fine. Just give the person that one too. The important point is that you don't end up with the same piece of paper. But the important thing is that you do end up with a piece of paper. Okay? Excellent. Now I'm going to assume that you all have now a piece of paper. I'm hopeful that it has something written on it. And if it doesn't, there is a lesson in cooperation and collaboration underlying this activity, which we'll come to at the end. Okay. Now, in some ways, the e-learning conferences are often about technology above all else. And you go to conferences and people want to talk about what's new, uh, what's a little bit sexy, what's different. Um, and I was quite struck, I think, by some of the comments about worldview. Um, I was picking up a vibe that there was a great interest in Taoism and Buddhism and Eastern philosophies and spirituality and underlying some of the message that we got in the last presentation. Um, and I think it's certainly true that one of the big changes I'm sensing, and I don't know how unique this is to an Anglo-Saxon view or a New Zealand view, is the idea that the old-fashioned kind of mechanistic view of the world is one that has less and less validity. So we're moving away from some of those ideas about the mechanical and starting to move more and more towards ideas of something more organic. I think that's quite interesting on lots of different levels. Um, certainly, the Anglo-Saxon world has and the Judeo-Christian world is a very mechanistic world. We talk about things being made. You know, God made the world. There are two other kind of primary world views. I think you could probably limit it to two. One is a kind of an Indian Hinduist world view, which is that the world is basically at play. It's a game. The divine is at play in the world. And the other is that Eastern philosophical notion that actually the world that is natural. It self-arises. It just is. It is the way that it is. It wasn't made. It wasn't created. And those, those kinds of worldviews do influence the way that we see social trends and social development and the way that we see education. Because up until very recently, education was there to make children in the image of that society. It might not have ever been articulated that way, but it had that kind of almost industrial notion that underpinned many of its assumptions. And some of those trends with technology sound obvious and might even sound slightly foolish, but I think they do affect the way that you see the world. Don't forget about Trin, by the way. We're coming back to her via the piece of paper in a second. I put up electrification as a trend, and people kind of find that quite hard, but that's because we're sitting in a developed country, in a very developed part of the world, 
we should remember that there are parts of the world. Uganda still only has about 3.7% of its population with access to electricity. So when we go to conferences and people talk about this connected world and ubiquitous broadband and everything else, in many cases they're right. Certainly the idea that there are in Africa, there was talk in one of the presentations over the last couple of days, I think it might have been Sue, I can't remember exactly who it was, about them leapfrogging, if you like, the whole uh, copper wire or fiber optic stage in internet uh, and moving straight to broadband handheld devices. And I noticed that very much in Kenya. You see the red and white uh, broadband transmitters absolutely everywhere. But actually, the, the individuals might actually have a mobile phone but not have electricity in their home. So I think some of those electrification is actually still a trend. And on the back of that comes access to a range of media. So a, there's a different type of connectivity. Um, it's not just about handing out mobile phones. I won't go into network space. It's just a bit of a shame because I could have talked about that for 10 minutes, but Nancy's sort of done the job. So Nancy talked a lot about how people connect, how they work together, the impact that that network change actually has on the individual. I think mobility covers not just social mobility. It also covers some of the uh, physical changes that we're seeing. People are now... And it's, it's, a, it's a trend. I'm not suggesting this is new. But don't please think that this is new or you'll be sitting there thinking I'm rather foolish. Of course, these things aren't new. But there is a trend in terms of mobility. Now, Estonia is part of a European Union, which means you can move around much more freely than you could 10 years ago. But internally, you would have been able to move, certainly in the last 20 years. In the United Kingdom, that social mobility is very detectable post-Second World War, so from the 1940s and 50s, people moving away to work and setting up home. And you know, the, the limitations, the restrictions... Uh, were not placed upon them. And there has been some suggestion that that had quite a lot to do with the telephone. The, the actual introduction of the telephone actually meant that people were prepared to move 30 miles away because they could still talk to their family and friends. One wonders whether we would have had that social mobility no matter how economically successful we had been if we hadn't have actually had the telephone. So that relationship between technology and social trends is very interesting. And my fourth um, comment would be about miniaturization. We haven't actually talked much at this conference about miniaturization, which is interesting. Um, I think it's just this idea that the devices that we're using... I mean, I, I've noticed... I, I'm a bit unusual because I have a huge MacBook, but I've noticed the number of people with their small little Acer machines... Um, Lisa, who ha sat there with her little device with a little keyboard, you know, twittering through sessions, um, that, that availability of access to networks through uh, miniature devices is getting more and more um, visible, I think. We're, we're seeing integration of those technologies now into clothing, into the environments that we're working in, and th that will have a direct impact on how people see knowledge and how they communicate with each other. I have no doubt about that at all. Some of the consequences of that, I think, are really very interesting. One is this um, trend towards interactive surfaces and projection technologies. And I want to just put those together, because actually I think they're directly related. Frederick's gone now, but Frederick was telling me about projects that they were working on where they were using Nintendos to control a projected image on a surface. So you literally walk around with a, a mini projector and you can use a Nintendo Game Boy to be able to manipulate and interact with that image. Turning any surface into an interactive writing surface. The ability to be able to walk up to somebody and actually project an image onto the front of them and quickly do a little search to find out who they are and be able to read their biography whilst you're talking to them. Um, not actually as foolish as it sounds, because if you were a policeman or an ambulance person and you had some of these medical records and you're working in very difficult conditions and you need both hands, the last thing you want to do is to actually try and pick up a device and find information. Maybe the first thing you want to do is to actually be able to give a voice command, project an image onto a surface and actually see the information that you need. So all of those developments in projection technologies uh, and interactive surfaces, I think, will have a bearing on education. 
We're already seeing this. Um, I don't know whether Smartboard operates in Estonia, the company Smartboard. They do? Okay. This year, Smartboard will be producing uh, a small table, which is actually made out of reinforced plastic. It's a very solid plastic table, which has a, a, a version of the Microsoft Surface multi-touch, multi-control Surface on it, so that children literally could sit and play with images or create things on a, a screen that they interact with. Well, we've got those touch screens already. You've all seen an iTouch. You've seen Apple's iTouch, where you can actually move things, characters on the surface. Many of you will probably have tablets, PC tablets, so you'll have seen that kind of technology before. The important point, or the interesting point, is that they're now beginning to introduce those actually in forms that you can take into a school. So a small plastic table, doesn't matter if the child pours paint on it, you can just wipe it down. But those are interactive surfaces. The universality of information is obviously having a huge impact, and there's been a lot of talk about that. Um, and so I won't say too much, because other colleagues have done a far better job of that uh, than me. But I was uh, quite pleased by a presentation about wikis, Timu, just because I'd been talking about wiki ethos as a kind of a, an idea, and I think that was a really good presentation. To, to A lot of people are aware of Wikipedia, but it was a really good presentation to see the breadth of that kind of almost underlying wiki concept um, about co-authorship, which goes back to my earlier point about the prosumer. The visualizations, well, we had quite a lot about visualizations as well. Um, I think as you improve the projection technologies, as you improve the interactive surfaces, you see the ability for people to be able to map and represent knowledge in lots of interesting and different ways. And the last trend or impact of trend, I think, is going to be this idea about remote engagement. How do I decide, why do I decide to learn in a particular place rather than another place? And can I choose, can I choose to engage uh, without going and meeting other people face to face? Can I choose to do that? I mean, in universities now, there's a huge confusion about the difference between blended learning and flexible learning and distance learning. The, the words are often interchanged when really they shouldn't be. Flexible learning to me means the ability for me to produce a course and teach a mixed group of students, some of whom maybe will attend class and use online support, and other students who will never attend class. And the question is, that's flexible because the student can make the choice. That's why it's flexible. So I may choose to do it in one mode, I may choose to do it in the other mode, or I might try to do it in both, choose to do it in both. And if I do do it in both, students can make a choice. They might come to classes for two weeks, and then actually their employer changes their job hours, and they can't come to class anymore. We don't want that student to drop out. So the more flexible we are, more opportunity we give to those students. I know that you're going to love this by the time we get to the end. So, so this is Trin. Um, Trin's now 30, um, and she's moved on a little bit, but she's working in universities. You'll be pleased that she stayed in the region. Are you pleased that she's kind of stayed in the Estonian region? She hasn't left, although she does speak fluent French and English. Um, and she's working for uh, a company called Apple X. I'll leave you to decide what that means. Um, and she's advising schools on mobile personal technologies. And she's going to commission a piece of technology that is wearable. In other words, it's going to be integrated into the clothes that I wear. Because there's some interest in this, and she has an interest in, in all kinds of aspects of psychomotor learning, so she's going to commission something that will allow learners to go and experience contexts at a distance. And my little imagination challenge for you, because you're all awake now, because you had to do it once. You see, some people are actually smiling. So they, some people are enjoying this, Sue, honest. I didn't think they would, but they are. Is what would you like to see? Just for a moment, pretend that you're Trin and you are able. They've got a lot of money, Apple X. A big company, very successful, and uh, bought out by the Chinese a couple of years ago. And they're very, very big. So there's lots of money, lots of investment, and they're really interested in this part of the world. Not sure why. I think because of the scale. 
It's like David Vincent was saying yesterday, there are things you can do in a country that's a certain scale. So they want to try it out in Estonia first. So she's going to design something, and I want you on your question two box, one line will do, more than a couple of words, but one line will do. What would you like to see her design? It's 2039, and she's designing a piece of wearable educational technology to allow learners to engage remotely. Two minutes. Okay, when you're done, I want you to fold it over again. And I want you to hand it to somebody different. So if you're sitting on your own, where well, there's two of you, you can't just hand it back to the other person. Hand it to somebody different that you didn't give it to before. Martin obviously likes walking around. Any excuse to get up. So give it to somebody else. Now, can I, just, can I just say, while you're doing that, while you're doing that, can I just say that for me, part of the fun of presenting, because most of my teaching I do online, part of the fun of doing presentations is, if you like, modeling things that I'd like to think audiences might use. So I don't know if you've ever done this exercise before, but it's quite a good thing to do with students. It's actually quite a good thing to do with students maybe in the first or second lecture because it actually makes them get up and go and talk to somebody else. And it almost doesn't matter what you're asking. It's an activity that actually just makes them talk. It makes them interact. It also sends a signal, which is that lectures are not about sitting and just listening very, very quietly. It's about doing something. It's about engaging, so that if in week four you turn around to them and say, now turn to the person next to you and have a conversation about, they don't all go, oh my God, how does that work? Okay, so for me, this is kind of a little bit of modeling. The other good thing about it is as you run out of time, <laughs> uh, it just means that you don't have to go all the way through. So I have to say that because I don't think I'm going to. But it is true, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to complete it in its entirety, it still works. So what about the changing nature of the school then? We've talked a little bit about some of the changes that we might see in the curriculum. We've talked a little bit about what the impact of technology might be. Um, and now we want to think about how the schools might change. There are big building programs going on in the United Kingdom at the moment for schools. Uh, that same process is being repeated in Australia and in the UK. A lot of money going into building schools. A lot of money going into revisualizing what those schools might look like. And so the title of this conference really appealed to me, precisely, excuse me, precisely because, I knew I shouldn't have opened the one that was fizzy, um, precisely because the idea of moving away from the concept of the physical space to something much more broad, uh, broadly defined as a learning space, I think is very, very um, interesting. One of the things about modeling, I just said about wanting to model some kind of practice, one of the things about modeling is that we know from the research that we do with teacher trainees who go to university and learn to be teachers that when they actually go into practice, when they start teaching in schools, they revert quite quickly to the way they were taught rather than the way they were taught at university to teach. So modeling behavior is extremely important. If we don't teach them in that remodeled behavior, then they won't go out and emulate that um, themselves. So. The trends that I think are going to affect school design, essentially, and these have been mentioned as well during the conference, so I'm just reinforcing these. I think David was talking about the, the way in which the learner's now a consumer. So they're making choices. Their parents are making choices, but they're making choices. My nieces had a lot to say about where they went to school. That wasn't the parents' choice. You know, it was about negotiation. It was about negotiating with them so that they were going to be motivated. Uh, and they got to say where they wanted to go, by and large, within reason. I think Florida was one choice, and that obviously wasn't going to happen. But discipline issues are obviously uh, a, a problem. I mean, I imagine that there are some discipline issues in Estonian schools. There certainly are in New Zealand schools. There certainly are in UK schools. And the question is why that might happen. It's a social trend. 
So why is it happening? We hear teachers being frustrated at the fact that they, they're substitute parents, that parents send their children, they offload these difficult children onto the schools. Why does that happen? The, the trend towards communities getting more closely engaged in schools, I don't know how things are here, but I know in quite a large number of places in the world, schools actually are moving towards opening after hours, sharing their computer facilities, sharing their library facilities, sharing their kitchens, if they have kitchens. And we are seeing a blurring boundary. Nancy was talking about uh, the access, the boundaryless working life that she obviously has. I suspect that there are one or two people in this audience who don't make a very strict distinction between when they stop working because they just carry on working as they get home. And probably the only time that they aren't in a work-life mode is when they're asleep because the rest of the time they're... Yeah. Um, I know several people who check their email on their devices as they kind of walk to the bathroom in the morning and so they're actually checking their email before they're doing their... Anyway, so moving on. Uh, I think the, the outcomes for that... Um, are going to be interesting. We are going to see a blending of social and learning spaces, definitely. We're seeing it already. We're also going to see people going to work and going to school for the purpose of social interaction. You go because you get to engage with fellow human beings in a process that is enriching. And I think we're seeing already the changing nature of work. People are making those decisions. And all because, if you like, we're working in a more, um, a less mechanistic way. The last point I think is very important. One of the reasons that we're seeing a change in the designs of schools and a change in the working hours of schools, changes to the curriculum, changes to the roles that we expect teachers to have in schools, is that most of our education systems are actually based around earlier models of agriculture and industry. Kids have the long summer off because it's harvest time. Kids actually had meals at, home, at school because parents weren't at home to provide meals for them. So, so all of those patterns, they, they start school when we start work. They finish school, unfortunately, earlier than most of us finish work, and we make other arrangements, and schools have after-hour classes. Why is that? If we were actually following... The research in neurobiology at the moment, we would actually be saying there's no point in having anyone aged 14 and over into school before 1 o'clock in the afternoon because they're all dead in the morning. But actually, there's really good reasons why they sleep all morning, good biological reasons why they sleep all morning. So maybe we actually do the young kids in the morning. Maybe morning school is for younger children who we know actually function quite well. And actually, adolescents don't function well. They have different sleep patterns, and maybe our schools should adjust for those sleep patterns. Maybe we should have six short semesters, not three long semesters. Maybe that will be different in the Southern Hemisphere than it is in the Northern Hemisphere, but changes to the design of schools and the curriculum, if they were actually pr putting first the way people learn and the biology of the way people learn, we wouldn't have the system that we have now. Now... I'm, I'm beginning to, not only because I've gone for 44 minutes and at some point Peter's going to have a go at me, probably, um, but also because I'm sensing that, that it might take too long to engage you in the activity. But I'm just going to let you know what's happening to Trin, because otherwise at the end you're going to be really frustrated. You're going to come up to me and say, what was Trin doing when she was... At? But you won't have to write this down on your piece of paper. Um, she's done really well, because she's now um, working for the Euro-Baltic government and a couple of the big organizations, which you will hear of when you get to 2060, the companies are getting involved with business in de designing these new social learning centers. And I'm not going to ask you to write it down, but you might just like to think about what you would expect to see in one of those learning spaces, given that it's, a, it's almost certainly a collaboration with business. I think it was David, wasn't it, that was talking about that collaboration with business and the need to provide things that business want. It's happening already, a lot. But by 2060, I think we can probably expect to see Muck Starbucks still poisoning the world, but nonetheless designing interesting social learning uh, opportunities. Okay. So I'm going to end by talking a little bit about personal identity, but I don't have to say very much, both because 
uh, of the last two presenters, but a number of other people. This was the bit that, that's why I've taken longer to get here. Um, this is the bit that, in a sense, really excites me. So I was slightly frustrated because Nancy was ticking all, my, ticking all the boxes as I went, but that's inevitable, really. Um, I think what we are seeing is an increasing access to the visibility, our visibility. You know, Google recently, I can't, don't know what the name is in Europe, that this idea that actually you can register your phone and anyone will know where you are if you give them permission, that kind of transparency, the availability. Nancy's saying, here are all of my different identities on the web, you can come and look at me, here I am. Um, and I'm sure that most of you in this audience at some point or other will have gone to Google and typed the name of somebody in just to find out a bit more about them. And most of the time, you're pleasantly surprised that you find several references to that person. Uh, I apparently am in a Spanish mumbo band. Um, I'm also a, an astrophysicist, and I'm a very, very talented art illustrator, because all those people share my name. And occasionally, people come up to me at conferences and say, you're not the guy that does those amazing drawings. I say, no, no, no. Sometimes I like to fib a little bit and tell them that I am in the Spanish mumbo band, but that's a... The flip side of that, of course, is privacy. What does that mean for privacy? We've talked a lot about the kind of lifestyle choices and the flexibility, the social freedom to be the person that you want to be. And one of the big trends internationally, which we often forget about in Europe, but is a very, very powerful trend internationally, in Africa and in Asia in particular, uh, is women's autonomy in those societies. And that's having a huge impact on the way that development happens, on the way that education is being formulated. Women's role in those societies is having a very dramatic impact, and it will feed into uh, the way that we do things in Europe, ultimately. I think we're also becoming more and more aware of the ethical issues in very broad terms. And the consequences of that are that, yes, there are concerns about privacy and expression. And I can't provide an answer to those. I'm just aware that, that that's going to be a serious issue. We talked about, several people have talked about modularized learning. We might not think that it's appropriate at the moment to stream boys and girls and put them in different classes. But in the new envisaged world of the school, what's to say that there wouldn't be single sex classes? Maybe boys will do better at maths if they go and do maths in a single sex setting. But maybe they'll go and do that in, the, in a class on their own at 8 o'clock in the evening with two male teachers or three mentors. So we have that flexibility to say, we're not saying that we should have single-sex schools. For some people, that's a philosophical position. Maybe it's not good for socialization. But what's to say in certain subjects, in certain contexts, that wouldn't be the best way for those learners to learn? I think we are increasingly, I mentioned it under curriculum, I think we're moving away from subjects and more towards those kinds of ideas about creativity, about uh, emotional intelligence. And those kinds of themes are things which will determine the kind of experience that learners have in schools. We're also definitely seeing this move already. Those of you that teach online must feel it. If you're teaching online, you're no longer necessarily in the traditional role of teacher. You're now enabling other people's learning. And I find that I go to sessions with academic staff now and I say, I'm not the e-learning facilitator. You are. That's your job as an academic. You are facilitating learning through the e-learning tools that you have. So actually, you're the e-learning facilitator. That's not a technical function anymore. That's uh, an academic role. And I think people are becoming more than one person, which I think is, is an interesting question about identity. So she's done really well, Trin. She's had a great life. She's had quite a big impact on education in this part of the world. She will have touched all of your lives, those of you that are still working. Um, and one of the things that she's gone on to do is to become very knowledgeable and very well respected in the whole question of identity law. Because we found, um, I mean, obviously, round about, I should say that round about 2073, I think it was, that Google... Um, actually had managed to make copyright illegal. So um, copyright was banned. Lisa, you'll be pleased to hear. No, that's less of a worry. Um, but nonetheless, there are issues about identity law. And one of the big questions, of course, that occurs then in the school is, well, apart from your registered um, birth profile, because obviously your DNA is on record, um, apart from that profile, which is your biological self, 
you are obviously a, a registered digital person as well. But the question is, can you be more than one digital person? Nancy was actually alluding to that, I think, in a sort of a strange way. So I think my, my conclusions, Peter, you'll be pleased to hear, because you're clock watching now, aren't you? Is uh, I think learning is becoming more flexible. We're seeing it already. I think there's going to be more negotiation. Fellow's not here anymore, is he? Is he gone? Yeah. Yesterday was talking about you know the whole thing with assessment and saying to the degree to which you might negotiate assessment. Um, I think we will see more negotiated learning, both in terms of when I learn, why I learn, how I learn, and who I learn with. We are obviously seeing more sharing of content, but also the sharing of those patterns, learning designs. So not just the content, but also how it was delivered, that teachers will pick that up, so will parents. So will students who will be teaching others. We all know as educators that the best way to learn is to teach. So actually getting students to mentor other students is a wonderful way of getting them to learn. And actually, this was touched upon. I, this was, must have been a, an answer, I think, to Nancy's question. Um, about, and it came up, I think, when David, David was talking about the Open University going you know, global. And Timu asked a question about you know, whether this was basically going to be culturally appropriate, in a sense, whether the Open University was going out and spreading you know, um, the OU way of doing things. That's, I think, was part of what your question was. I think what we'll see... Um, is more universal content, more themes-based, non-local, non non-culturally specific content, which will be put out there, but then recontextualized for the local content. And that's part of the open educational resource movement, that people will pick things up and recontextualize them. We'll see a lot more of that. We'll see this changing role for schools, because they'll become places where you engage. Teachers uh, will be not just teaching subject content, they might have that subject expertise, but actually what they'll really be doing is designing engagement. They'll be engineering engagement for their students. And I wonder the extent to which actually part of the result or the response to the discipline issue is to reintegrate school into community. One of the reasons maybe that children do misbehave and we have discipline issues that we have at schools is a question of identity and a question of motivation. It's all those things. But those environments don't necessarily give them that positive message about their identity. And so to reintegrate them into the community means that they, they come with that community identity. It's not separate from who they are at home. It is who they are. Somebody said to me a couple of weeks ago that, that all, at a similar presentation that actually all of this was far into the future and unpredictable. And just out of curiosity, uh, if, if you haven't been to TED.com, I I'm, 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 know the Americans will, but, but are you aware of TED.com? Yeah. Fantastic website. Well worth going to look at. Um, basically, they're very short videos of people giving really great ideas. And the two that I just pulled out in response to the, well, but what you're saying is never going to happen. Dave Edgars runs something. In fact, it was actually on one of Nancy's slides. I saw it on one of Nancy's slides. Uh, it's called Valencia 826, it's 826 uh, which is a project around mentoring. It's basically putting, putting uh, part-time tutors. They're actually individuals out in the community. They're not qualified teachers necessarily, but under the guidance of teachers, it provides a resource of individuals who can sit with a student and tutor them face-to-face -face in very informal settings. And it's spreading as a movement around the United States, and he's doing some amazing work with that. Not dissimilar from the kind of community-based, you know, borderless school that I'm talking about. And the technology side of things, if, if this is well worth a look, I thought it was quite fun. These little blocks, which are essentially, each of these is a little mini computer. It has a radio transmitter in it, it's wireless, and essentially they're intelligent building blocks. But it's that whole psychomotor learning thing that students can actually put these things together. Uh, and so they're programmed to actually give you the right answer. Or they could have words, they could be letters, and you actually spell words, and after 20 seconds or 30 seconds they change again. It's well worth going and having a little look. So really, this isn't um, as far-fetched as at first one might think. And because I'm very self-conscious uh, of the fact that Lisa is in the audience in particular, um, those are all my copyright references for my images, because otherwise somebody would come up and say something to me. Uh, and all I want you to do now is to look at the piece of paper which you shouldn't have, you know, because you handed it to somebody else. So you should have a piece of paper that you didn't write on, but which somebody else wrote two things on, 
which should be interesting, provocative, thoughtful. Thank you very much.